Good morning. The scripture reading this morning will be from John 6, 25 through 34. John 6, 25 through 34. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man shall give to you, for on him the Father, even God, has set his seal. They said therefore to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. They said therefore to him, What then do you do for a sign that we may see and believe you? What work will you, will you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, He gave them bread out of heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, It is not Moses who has given you the bread of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. They said therefore to him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. Thank you, Tim. It's a great day to be able to worship God and to see all the things that he's been doing. It was good to be with the men yesterday. Uh, Good to be able to have breakfast and uh, be able to listen to some people talk about things. And so that was exciting. During that, Vince said that I had 45 minutes. So I'm just letting you know, because he gave me that permission. So he was the only one voting, I think. The only way to cut that time down is for you guys to listen faster. Okay, you got it? So if you listen faster, we may cut that down just a little bit. We do have a new quarter starting, and so classes next Sunday, uh, not this coming Wednesday, but next Sunday there'll be new classes that are going to begin, and I know uh, Wednesday night classes especially will change the week after that. So if you're planning on being in Nancy's class, there's already homework And so she has some questions sheets at the Welcome Center for you to participate in, to be able to study for the classes. You've still got time to be able to do the homework and everything else. Just on another note, there is a class right next door that does not require homework. (laughs) So I just thought I'd mention that part. I don't know, you know, just in case you're not the homework type person. So just thought I'd let you know about that as well. This is one of those lessons today that I'm really excited about because I've been thinking about this, working on this. Some of this came out of symposium and some of this came out of different things that have been putting in and that's I just find this a very challenging topic to me today, and so I hope you're going to find this as well. When Jesus was doing miracles, he fed the 5,000. But it wasn't just as simple as that. You see, they're seeing all these people that are coming to him, and rather than just looking out and seeing all of these people and saying, well, you know, here comes a bunch of people, he says, well, I want you to give them something to eat. And so as we look at some of the parts and what he's really trying to get across here, he says to Philip, I want you to give them something to eat. Okay, Uh, we don't have enough money is Philip's response. It'd take 200 denarii worth of bread and we don't even have that. That's a year's wages for somebody working full time to be able to give even a little bit to all of these people. And we just don't have that kind of money and so we can't do it and so Jesus you're asking us for the impossible and he says well how much do you have well Andrew pipes up we found a kid with a lunch you know five loaves and two fish he says fine just have everybody sit down and so they sit down in in groups and they begin to pass out the the bread and then the fish and so as they're doing all of these different things they find 
Well, sure enough, we got enough. And then he says, I want you to pick up the leftovers. And so they go through and they pick up the leftovers. And they've got 12 baskets full of leftovers. Well, all of this is to test them. All of this is to give them a concept of what Jesus is trying to say to them in the world. And I think this is very, very important. As Jesus is trying to teach them about this, it's not just them. Because John is writing it down so that it will be for us as well. It's not just about that. And then Jesus goes across the sea, and the crowds follow. And as they get to across the sea, well, then they start asking him about the miracle. And they are, start saying, well, you know, we saw this. And so they're asking him about, well, you know, we remember when you passed out the bread. And, you know, they say, well, what is it that would be the thing that you want us to do most of all? And he says, here is the work of God that you believe in the one that he sent. Seems simple enough, right? Seems simple enough. You have to get the context of the whole thing, and, you know, that doesn't seem like a very difficult thing. What must we do to do the work of God? Is there question? It's a key question. I mean, I think that's what people have wondered all the time. What do I do to obey God? What's the most important thing? How would I do that short of what must I do to be saved? This is the next question, isn't it? Now that I'm saved, what would I do in order to do the work of God? And the work of God, he says, is to believe in him whom he has sent. Well, okay. Seems pretty simple. I imagine if you ask anybody in Christian nation today, whether it's ours or anywhere else, do you believe that there is a Jesus, they would say, yeah, I think there's a Jesus. So, you know, we're doing pretty good, right? We do all the work of God. In fact, if you go to a sporting event, you're going to see a John 3.16 out there somewhere, right? Right? So that lets you know that people would believe that Jesus is the Son of God because that's what that verse is about. And by the same token, I think the only reason they put such a huge sign out there other than to distract the pitcher might be to, that people would read that and realize I need to believe in Jesus as the Son of God. Okay, well, I saw it at the ball game. Hey, we're good. Because there's 50, 60, 70,000 fans there. We just got 70,000 people to do the work of God. They read that sign, John 3.16, as the ball was being thrown. We're good. We did the work of God, didn't we? And somehow you're left with a very uneasy feeling that that isn't what Jesus was talking about. And so they proceed to say, well, what about this? Um... Moses had them, you know, give manna from heaven. What sign do you say that, you know, they're trying to get lunch. That's what it's really all about. They're trying to get lunch. Jesus, we know you do miracles. We had lunch yesterday. It was great. So what sign would you do in order to, and it gets sidetracked into this whole thing about Moses with manna in the wilderness. And he says, God is giving life to this world through Jesus. I want you to understand it. I am bread of life. And as you watch that whole discussion, you're able to see how he talks about this whole thing as, as bread of life and as a way to do what God really wants, to believe in Jesus. So how do we do that? How would we do that? Well, read your Bible, pray every day, and you be saved, right? Everything's good. What is he specifically talking about? I think we get caught by a lot of things today. Because we get doubtful. I don't know exactly what it is that God wants. And there are some times that are very specific planned times. Let me show you one of those in Mark chapter 14. Uh, verse 12. They're talking about the Last Supper and where they're going to eat the Passover. So he says, on the first day of the unleavened bread, when they had sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples asked him, where will you have us go and prepare 
for you to eat the Passover. Then he sent two of his disciples and said, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room that I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. There prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. So what you have happening here is very much a a matter of God saying, here's the way things are going to work. And this is pretty incredible detail if you think about it. He said, you know, where are we going to prepare Passover? It's the time where the lamb's already been killed. You've got to go someplace, right? And so he gives him these kind of details. Now, how would you know who's going to be walking outside this building right now? You can't really know that, can you? Much less, you know, nine streets over, four blocks down. I want you to follow that guy because he will be carrying, I mean, this is what this is like. He will be carrying a jar of water and he's going straight there. He's not going to stop off anywhere else. He's going to go into the house. It's going to be an upper room and the upper room will already be set and ready and prepared. Wow, that's incredible detail. Don't you wish God did that all the time? I wish God would say to me, here is exactly what I want you to do. And sometimes he does that. And sometimes we don't know. And I think that's where we get stuck. We go, well, obviously God has a will. God's worked everything out. God has a plan. And so therefore, we don't know. I want to suggest something that's a little bit different. Because we try to say, well, either God plans everything and does everything and has it all set out, or everything is random. It's going to be one or the other. It doesn't have to be one or the other. You know, God can have some events that are very detailed, very planned out that he knows exactly, and then you get into the whole question of how much does God know when... He knows it. Does he know that he knows it? Would he know if he didn't know it? Since he's an almighty, all-powerful God, wouldn't he know that he didn't know? And you get, I know it can get very convoluted after that. The whole thing is that we don't know. And if we don't know the will of God, how are we going to do it? How is that even going to be possible? There are some times that are very detailed, and Jesus gives them the very exact detail. If you look at the story in, in Acts 10 of Peter and Cornelius, it's, it's an exact detail. He's already sent the guys two days earlier from Cornelius, and he says there's going to be a knock on the door, and the knock on the door is timed with the vision, and you know, it's, you know there's guys at your door, I want you to go down, and I want you to leave with them. Well, he had to have known that they left two days ago. I mean, there's... There's incredible timing in here. And then there's the rest of us. Did you ever feel like the rest of the, you know, God, I wish you'd tell me what to do. I would be glad to do something if you just let me know. I think that's what he's trying to do with the disciples here. As you look at this passage and look at what he's really trying to say, not everything is scripted. Some things just happen in real time. And Jesus encounters people in real time. I mean, so when you've got the disciples who are there and they see the crowd coming and Jesus says, well, why don't you give them something to eat? They're going, huh? We, uh, we can't do that. We don't have that. We don't have anything there. We have a lunch. Well, he says, Okay. Because there isn't isn't a script or they don't know the script. And so they say, we don't know how to do this. And I think that's where we get stuck. He didn't give us specific directions. I mean, we could even build an ark if he'd give us specific directions like that. But he didn't give us any specific directions, so we don't know what the will of God is. And then he comes up with this crazy statement, the will of God is believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus? Okay, it's a John 3.16 thing. 
It's a sign at a ball game. We believe in Jesus. Good, we've done that. I don't think we really quite understand what that means. Because let me show you the other side of this whole thing. We have to believe Jesus is in the here and now. That Jesus is doing something right here and right now. And yes, you have the man with the jar of water, but let me show you a couple of others that are examples of these different things. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 21, Jesus has already died on the cross. You've, you've got him risen. You've got him appearing. And they're in that time in between. It says, so one of the men who had accompanied us, and they're talking about, you know, putting in another apostle. Peter's kind of upset about this whole thing. There were 12. Judas died. We've only got 11. We obviously need 12, and he's got some scriptures. And so they're, they're trying to find another apostle. How would we go about that? So he says, so one of the men who has accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and they said, Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place of of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven. Well, there's no directions. Nobody said, I want you to find an apostle this way. Uh, there's, there's nothing that's there that says, I want you to do it like this. And so they come up with requirements and they say, well, we think this would be good. We think we need the 12th guy. Jesus appointed 12. One died, so let's find another one. They weren't willing to wait for Paul to be that number 12. They're like, no, we need one now. And the other guy's got three names, so I think they picked the guy with the shorter name. No, that's not really how they did it. I mean, they had what's called casting lots, and while we don't know exactly what that's like, there seems to be something about odds and even stones that were done. The priestly robe and the ephod had stones, Urim and Thummim. They even named the stones, and it seems as if, best we can tell, they were white on one side, black on the other side, and so you either got odds or evens. And you would say, if it's this, then this, if it's that, then that. And so they would throw the stones. And the amazing part is, they said, God said. They believed God had spoken. Right into their world, right at that time, this is the will of God. You know, if it didn't turn out like why I wanted it, I might say, you know, how about two out of three? You know, let's throw again. Maybe, you know, if it comes up three, four times in a row, then we say, okay, seems like God is making it turn out. No, no, one throw, one toss, God said. They believed God was working in the process of what was happening in their world right then. They didn't have a clear, specific direction. They didn't have something, I mean, Jesus said, you know, a chosen 12, and sure enough, Judas had died, and you kind of knew that already, that he wasn't going to be with the 11, but here he is. And so they decide to do this. I want you to realize that I think that's part of the power of the early church. They believed God was in the process of what was happening in their life right then, right now. God is alive. God is doing this. God is dynamic in the present world, and he is working in the details down to the flip of a thumbin. Can you imagine that kind of direction from God? I don't have it written down, but... This is the way I'm going to take this. And everyone in the room believed in the outcome of the toss. This is God speaking into our world. 
They didn't know before the toss. Whether God knew before the toss, I imagine. But they didn't know. And they said, God be in the toss. And he was. The will of God is, we believe, Jesus is in the here and now. That he is alive, that he is working. It is not just a historical Jesus. It is not just some Bible story somewhere. It is not just, you know, crackers with fish that we would teach in a Bible class and say, oh, here's what the story was about. I want you to realize what the story is about. He was asking them to act on behalf of those people. He was asking them to act like he would act. What would Jesus do as he sees a crowd coming? You give them something. That's what Jesus would do. And they're like, uh, 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 we, we don't have enough. He says, all right, you have to learn some things first. You have to believe God is in the here and now. And when I say, you give them something to eat, what do you got? A lunch? Sometimes that's the best we've got is, and, and God can't really do that. We have to believe God is in the process of what we do with our faith. It is the what happens next, that it is useful to him, and that no matter what happens, God will be glorified in it, whether it's something that's good or whether it's not something that's good, but God will be glorified in it. Not that everything is all controlled and we're waiting for God to somehow reveal it to us, but that there is a dynamic that says, God is at work in my world, and yes, I'm a man of faith, and yes, I'm able to act into that. We believe, and we follow Jesus. So we believe Jesus as he acts in this world. And that's what he taught his disciples to do, was to be him in the world, to preach him in the world. And that's what you see happening all along. Acts chapter 3, you have one of those interesting stories where Peter and John are going to the temple. They've been going to the temple at the hour of prayer for years. I mean, since they were little kids. And there's been a guy sitting there for years. And all of a sudden, one day, they decide that, you know what? Today's the day. And they heal the guy. And I don't think they were really thinking beyond that. But they looked at him and they go, you know what, we don't have any silver and gold. But in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And he did. What an amazing thing. And you just have to realize that when God's going to do things like that into your life, you're ready to talk about him. And so then you come down to verse 11 in that story. It says, while he, the guy who had been healed, clung to Peter and John, and all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Now, does that sound like a plan ahead? He didn't say, let's heal this guy, and then I'll have a chance for a sermon. No, it's like, hey, there's a guy. I bet we could heal that guy. I get we could give him what God has to give to him. I don't have silver and gold, but I'll give you this. And so he heals him. And so when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? And why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murder to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And here's the the part. And by his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given this man his perfect health in the presence of you all. You realize what Peter's saying? He says, I didn't heal the guy. I did not heal that guy. It was Jesus who healed that guy. And he is believing in Jesus and the power of Jesus. He's ready to say, you know what? I don't have power enough to do this. It's not about me. 
it is all about Jesus. And when he believes in Jesus, he's finally got the concept. That's what I wanted you to do. I wanted you to go be me to the world. He says, Jesus healed this guy. I know it was Peter, and he was standing right there, and he said, get up and walk. He had no plan to preach the sermon on salvation, but that's immediately what he does. He says, don't you realize what happened here? Jesus is able to do these things. Jesus is present in our world. Jesus speaks into our world. Jesus heals in our world. Jesus is in the process of God working in our world right now. He's very quick to give credit to Jesus. Jesus healed. It is faith in Jesus that has given him this perfect health. And that's what he draws to. And I think we see that over and over again as you look at different things. You, you look at Philip with the Ethiopian. He says, I want you to go join the chariot. What, to get a ride? He didn't tell him what to do after that. Uh... Okay, I'm supposed to hitchhike and get a ride, and here he is, and the guy's trying to study, and you know what comes out is just kind of natural. He preached Jesus to him. Because after all, that's what it's all about, isn't it? For us to be Jesus to the world, and so he preached Jesus to him. It's essential to our evangelism that we recognize Jesus is at work in our world today. And that we are the ones who's able to do something and we're able to say something because Jesus is at work. We believe in Jesus. We believe not just that he's some historical figure, but he is here present right now and that he is going to be in the next conversation you have. He's going to be in the next action you have. He's going to be with you when you hit work tomorrow. And you as a person of faith are able to say, in the name of Jesus, here's what can happen. Now, I'm not asking you to heal any lame men or anything like that. I mean, we've got TJ. You can all try. Is that okay with you, TJ, if everybody tries to get you up? Okay, see, TJ's willing. But I don't think that's the point. I'm sure TJ would think that's the point. But it's a matter of doing what God wants done next. And when we see that, as God is in my next conversation, it's what's going to change everything. There's not a programmed outcome that we should discover. There is a process that is ongoing for people who believe in Jesus to act in this world in his name, in his power. And that's what church is all about. When Paul walked into a city, it's no longer a normal city. There's a man of God in there. And the prayer of faith from a man of God can change events, can change things that happen. And I think we see this in a lot of different ways. Mark 11, and I'm sorry I'm having to blow through this quite so fast but Mark 11 you see the the process of a withered fig tree and Jesus goes to the fig tree he doesn't find anybody it's right after triumphal entry he doesn't find any any of the little nubs and so he curses it and he says nobody's ever going to eat figs from you again and the disciples heard it and okay that's what's going to happen and they come back The next day, he clears the temple, and they see this tree that's been withered. And it's amazing to look at the passage. He says, as they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away at its roots. And Peter remembered, and he said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed is withered. Now, why is that a big deal? They've seen people raised from the dead. Jesus has cured cancer. He has made people walk. He's made blind people see. And now we're to horticulture? Jesus, a bush died. Really? Why are you so amazed at this? I think it's because it's not scripted. Who would ever think that? Who would ever believe that a bush died? I mean, we got limbs falling all around here. Who would ever think that? I hope none of you were talking to God about our trees out here. But here's the rest of it. 
Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. What's he trying to say? He's taken a bush as an example to teach. He says, don't you realize who you are in this world? Don't you realize that um, I'm walking along and I get frustrated with a bush and I know this bush isn't ever going to produce anything and I say, you might as well die now. And sure enough, the next day, the bush is dead. He says, don't you realize you have the same power to command and to call and to say, because you are my people in this world. Whatever you pray about is going to happen. Whatever you call into being is going to happen. I want you to have faith in God. Translated, believe in Jesus In this world, he is God on earth. It's the same thing. It's the same admonition. Whatever you want to do to do the will of God is believe in Jesus, but believe it into your life right now. Whatever you pray, down to forgiveness, is possible. And it's going to happen. I hope that makes a difference for you because what an incredible thing it is to realize that that's the place Jesus put us as people of God that we're able to speak into that. Okay, let me give you the cap on this whole thing. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John are thrown in prison. But the church has grown. Verse 4 says, many of those who had heard the word believed. The number of men came to be about 5,000. And Peter and John are thrown in prison. As they're thrown into prison, they don't know what's going to happen. But people are praying for them. They get released out of the prison. Hmm, amazing, right? They get released out of the prison and they go back to the people as they're praying and they pray to God and he says listen we understand about the enemy that he's here but we want you to grant that we will speak with boldness as you do signs and wonders and the earthquake happens I don't think it's really just a coincidental earthquake I think God's kind of shaking the place and going amen amen Because who they are in the world makes a tremendous difference. It's hard to take care of people. They've got 5,000. The number of men, about 5,000. Now, does that sound familiar in any way at all? John 6.10. Jesus said... Have the people sit down. There's lots of grass, so they sat down 5,000 in number. We're at the cross point of what Jesus was trying to teach his apostles with the healing of the 5,000. And so the next phrase and the next paragraph that you see after the prayer and after the boldness to speak and after the place being shaken is that God is working. And you see verse 32. The full number of those who have believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common. And with great power the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all and there was not a needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them. 
and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. It is a different time. They are one heart and soul. But they learned how to feed the 5,000. Do you realize what he's saying? There's not a needy person among them. Great grace is upon them all. In the same way that the apostles had passed out fish and bread to 5,000 men who came and sat at the feet of Jesus, they now pass out to people who have need in a church the exact same number. Jesus has finally taught them what it means, how to live this out. And they could have said, you know, we don't have any money for that. And they didn't, and they were right. And it isn't about money whatsoever at all, is it? Because people came and the need was met, and this time it's 5,000 people of faith. God is working among them. And whether it's the 5,000 people that Jesus fed or the 5,000 people that Peter fed, the result is the same. Jesus is working among them. And as you look at Jesus, you see this great miracle that happens out of a little boy's lunch. And as you look at Peter in Acts chapter 4, I think you see a great miracle that happens. Because how does this ever work? It's just people who say, you know what? I think someone's going to need this. To be part of a group like that, where God is working among them, to be people of faith like that, that can mirror the miracle of Jesus, is to say Jesus is alive in this world. Is to say, I believe in Jesus. And we're going to see it happen every day. I want you to realize that's where you are. That's where you sit. People of faith will change the world. And maybe it's time they changed you. So the question this morning is, do you believe in Jesus? Is he acting in your world? Is he at that place where you can say, you know what, I don't have that clear direction. Where's the guy with the water jar? He says, no, I just want you to act. I just want you to speak. I just want you to do. And what an amazing thing you're going to see happen in your life as God works out all of those things. Maybe today you've been resistant to Jesus and to trying to follow him at all. I want you to realize he's not a John 3.16 sign at a sports event. He is the power of this world. And he's the power in your life. Do you want to be able to do that? Do you want to be like Jesus? Do you want to follow him? Now's the time. Come while we stand and sing. Unto the O Lord. Do I lift up my soul?